Hello, everybody. This is Terry from the Pre-Mom team with special guest Michaela Dalton, Fertility Awareness Method Instructor, here to talk in our third installment of Myth Busting. And I love these so much because sometimes I'm surprised. Sometimes you actually, something is, you tell me something is kind of a myth, kind of not. Uh, so it's always fun to do these with you, Michaela. Thank you for joining us today. Great to be here again. Yeah. All right, so let's go. Our first myth is trying too hard makes it hard to get pregnant. Oh, I hate this one. <laughs> oh, this this so myth would be fun. Yeah, <laughs> this myth gets a rise out of me because when people are struggling to conceive, it comes across as so victim blamey you know <laughs> like I just you should relax you know you're trying too hard you're doing it wrong you know like, ah. <laughs> especially because when they first started trying they probably weren't trying too hard at all they were probably relaxed to begin with um so if just relaxing was all that it took um that would be one thing so no what this is a myth you know you you um trying too hard doesn't make it harder to get pregnant as such. Um, what is true is that stress can negatively impact our cycles and our reproductive health. So the human body is so complex and there are many interactions or interrelationships between different systems of your body. And so sustained high stress can affect your reproductive health. Um, some people check on their cortisol levels uh, or their adrenal function. And there are anecdotal reports of people conceiving when they finally you know, stopped trying. Um, but these anecdotes aren't sufficient to come to that kind of conclusion that trying too hard makes it harder to get pregnant uh, because some people stop trying and they don't miraculously become pregnant. Um, but it is important to, uh, manage our stress levels and to manage our emotional health uh, when we're trying to conceive. So uh, I personally partner with organic conceptions in my own fertility consulting work. And I know that Premom does as well. Um, they're an excellent organization. So if anyone was on the trying to conceive train and finding themselves emotionally struggling with it, um, this organization is uh, created specifically to support emotional health, like during these difficult times. So uh, you can actually uh, check out check them out through the uh, the app under the more section as well. Wonderful. Yeah, they have a wonderful program and just a wonderful group of people that they have working in that team. Yeah, they do. This one I thought was interesting. You should avoid dairy while trying to conceive. Ooh. <laughs> This is a hard myth for me because I'm not a nutritionist. Um, so I'd always consult, suggest consulting with your doctor or an expert in the field. Uh, I do know that some people are intolerant to dairy products and they may cause an inflammatory state in their body, which is not good for their health and their reproductive health. Um, but there's also some research showing that full fat dairy has a positive effect on reproductive health. Uh, so if if you're not dairy intolerant and you don't want to give up your dairy, then you might be interested in Googling the Harvard fertility diet and seeing what that says about it. So that one could be a myth or it yeah. could, depending on how your body handles dairy. Yeah, depending on your body and dairy. So if you don't have a problem with dairy, it's actually good. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Now the next one is, you can't get pregnant if you're overweight. Well, I guess I'm a personal example to the contrary. I got pregnant when I was overweight. Um, <laughs> I was I was still trying to lose weight from that I'd gained during the first pregnancy when I got pregnant with the second pregnancy. So I just stacked it on top of the stack. Um, so I know from personal experience that this one is a myth. Um, but the myth is coming from somewhere. And I think where it's coming from is that being significantly underweight or significantly overweight can reduce your fertility. 
Um, so there are different reasons underlying why it reduces your fertility, but both states can affect your hormone levels and inhibit ovulation. So there are some cases where women who were very significantly overweight in the obese category, um, and it's not like it's not that every woman who is obese will have difficulty conceiving either, but some of them might do, and they stop ovulating. Um, so they might begin ovulating again when they start losing some weight. And some women who are significantly underweight stop ovulating as well. Um, you sometimes hear about this in cases where people have eating disorders like anorexia, and they will most likely begin ovulating again after gaining some weight. So there are extremes on the weight spectrum, um, but in, and in both cases, you can get a better hormonal balance by moving closer to the center of that spectrum. Um, but to just being overweight on its own uh, doesn't mean you can't get pregnant because I did. <laughs> Mostly a myth, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't take a look at something if there's a concern there. Yeah, you can look at your health and if you're not ovulating, then if you're significantly under or overweight, then that might be something to look at. Okay. This one I see come up in the Facebook group we have every so often. You can choose whether you conceive a boy or a girl. I think you referred to it as gender sway. Gender swaying, yeah. Um, the, it's basically a myth. That's a, that's a big myth. So uh, if you want to go by anecdotes, you'll find people who said, well, I did this and it worked. And then you'll find people who said, well, I did this and I got the opposite result. Um, <laughs> so uh, there was a method of gender swaying uh, that was called the Shettles method that's been pretty well debunked by now. It was, it was based on ideas about how sperm, the X and the Y sperm, the male and the female sperm are different. And some of those ideas have been debunked now with um, more focused um, visualization techniques and looking at what the sperm actually do. Um, so the Shettles method has been debunked, but anything that's kind of gained popularity in the public consciousness kind of hangs on long after it's been shown not to, to work the way that it was supposed to work. So I think, I think that's still swimming around in, in, the, in the public consciousness. It is a myth. Um, there's only one thing I could find uh, that apparently had documented results that were reasonably good, but I haven't read it. Um, so there was a, a Billings study done that had uh, reportedly outstanding success results, like in the 90 something percent for uh, obtaining the desired sex. But given that everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah, given that every other approach has been debunked or found not to have a significant influence, uh, I, I'm going to hold my judgment on that one. <laughs> Until a, a significant new study or multiple studies come out. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. And then we have um, phases of the moon affect menstruation. I thought that was a fun one. Yeah. Well, you know, if you have a reasonably regular cycle, then you might notice that things are happening for you at around the same time. If you're noticing phases of the moon, um, you might notice that, oh, wow, you know, last time I had my period, it was around the full moon as well, you know, and that's just a function of your cycle, overall cycle length. But phases of the moon don't affect all women or else we'd all be menstruating at the same time in like great swaths <laughs> across, you know, the country. Uh, and that doesn't happen. And some people say the reason it doesn't happen is that our circadian rhythms and our cycle rhythms have been all messed up by the prevalence of artificial light. Uh, but this has been looked at in a study of uh, women living in a tribe or in a community with no artificial light and they didn't all menstruate at the same time either it wasn't they didn't sync with each other and they didn't sync with all sync with the moon so i'd say that one's pretty solidly in it so fun though let's see we have it's easy to get pregnant after you've already had a child well it was for me <laughs> Uh, but it's not for everybody. So, um, 
this one's hard to actually say whether it's a, a, a myth or true because most people don't experience infertility. So for them, getting pregnant after a first child is just as easy as getting pregnant with the first child. Um, for some women who've struggled to conceive and then get pregnant and have their first child, they might find that they don't have any further problems getting pregnant after that. So whatever went wrong, the pregnancy reset their body and that's good. But um, so for them, getting pregnant is easier after a first child. Uh, but let's not forget the the numbers of people who have what's called secondary uh, a secondary infertility. So they have a, a, a child, or even children, and then suddenly struggle with conceiving after that. So I'm, I'm gonna if I come down on a side, I'll just say that it's not always easy to get pregnant after a first child. Okay, and then we have one more. Um, infertility comes from the woman. Oh, oh another blaming one. All right, no. <laughs> why, are, why are so many fertility myths kind of a little bit blamey? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not coming from the woman uh, all the time. Um, so infertility affects about 10% of people in the USA. So it can vary a little bit around the world, um, but I'll focus on the US since that's where I am right now. Um, about 10%, it's about 9% of men and 11% of women report infertility issues. Um, roughly when, when inf infertility happens for a, 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 a couple, roughly a third of them are due to uh, the woman's health and roughly a third of them are due to the man's health. And then the rest of the time, the, the other third, roughly, uh, it's both of them together. So anybody oh, who, wow. yeah, I know, it's like pretty evenly dispersed. So anybody who's, who's facing infertility, um, really like both, both people need to get checked out because it could be either or both. Any um, other follow-up thoughts on any of those myths that we talked about today? Oh, let me let me think. Um, oh, the overweight thing. So, oh, that that hits at my heart a little bit <laughs> because I've had my weight fluctuate a fair bit, and I I put on so much weight when I'm pregnant, um, and I think that we need. Uh, better, more nuanced approaches and more sensitive approaches for women who are like on on either end of of the spectrum for for weight, uh, because there can be things going wrong that are not just weight related. For, uh, one example is that women with PCOS might tend to be overweight themselves. Um, it's one of the uh, signs of PCOS. Um, there are a whole range of different signs and symptoms that come with that. And if you get uh, a, somebody who doesn't know any better, like say, well, if you lost some weight, you know, that's the problem. Well, actually, no, the problem is the underlying condition, right? And the weight is a sign of that, but just losing the weight may not necessarily like completely fix the, the person so that they can conceive. Um, so I think it's important to remember that weight is just one small thing and there might be other things going along with that. Um, and it's it's a very emotionally fraught area as well. <laughs> um, yeah, emotional and very sensitive. And I know I've seen women post, like I went to my doctor and I think even nurse Linda said she had a similar issue with that question because her doctor said, you just need to lose weight. And nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> well, or if we're on the opposite spectrum, like you need to gain weight. It's, it's also a, a challenging situation. Um, so I'm, it's, I'm glad you addressed that today. Yeah, people need support to, to maintain a, a decent level of health for themselves. And shaming doesn't do it. And overly simplistic approaches don't do it as well. Like sometimes weight is a factor, but... I feel like in, in many aspects of society, if a, particularly for women, if they go to a doctor with an issue and they are observably overweight, 
then very often suddenly the focus changes to that and everything is put down to the weight and like all the other things that are just being ignored because like it's the fault of the fat, you know. Um, so I think that's something to remember. It's a factor, but it doesn't define everything, especially reproductive related. And we do actually have uh, someone who gave us a myth. See what it is. It's, is the myth true that it's easier to get pregnant after a miscarriage? That's an interesting one. Ooh, you know what? There, there is some study on that. And there, let me see if I can, if you don't mind me typing away, I'm going to look for this study that I have. Um, let me bring this up. All right, so after an early pregnancy loss, um, let's see if I can find this. Okay. All right, so there was a study that found, uh, it had 91 women that had experienced an early pregnancy loss um, and that 19 of them conceived within the first 12 weeks with no miscarriage in those um, conceptions. And 18 of them proceeded normally. And 30 of the women conceived between 12 and 26 weeks after their early pregnancy loss with um, 29 of those pregnancies proceeding normally and none of those miscarried either. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess, it's true. <laughs> I remember this study, uh, and if anybody wants to look it up, uh, if I can, it's Rudd, R-U-D, and Klunder, K-L-U-N-D-E-R, and it's from back in 1985. Um, and then there was another study uh, done in 1994 uh, with I don't know how to pronounce this person's name, Weiss or Weiss, W-Y-S-S, Biedermann and Hook, H-U-C-H. And they saw no reason to recommend a waiting period between an early pregnancy loss and a subsequent pregnancy. They found that the risk of another early pregnancy loss was about 20% irrespective of the interval duration. Um, and Let's see, Devanzo, Hale, and Raman from 2012, so that's the most recent study I have on my list here, uh, found that the shorter the time following a miscarriage, the more likely the subsequent pregnancy resulted in a live birth. Wow. Yeah, so <laughs> we have, yeah, we have some, uh, some information that shows that hormone levels and luteal phase length might not go back to normal in following a miscarriage. It might take a cycle or two to get back to normal. But given the studies we have, it doesn't seem to affect uh, pregnancy rates. And they look, they look really good. It looks like it's, it's easier. <laughs> so. well, that's um, not a myth. Um, not true for everyone, clearly, but some really hopeful information about those Get yeah. miscarriages, the, that hopeful. Yeah. It means there's a lot of rainbow. Really? Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Michaela, again for a wonderful presentation.